So <laughs> just give me a smile. No, that's a proper smile. Yeah. <laughs> you do. Okay, who are we? Okay, yeah. Let's go from the top again. All right. Who are we? Who are we? Who are we? We are Holy Spirit empowered servants like, like Jesus. Jesus. We are. We are. We are the hospitable family of Jesus. We are. We are strategic missionaries for Jesus. We are disciples devoted to Jesus. We are helping people find and follow Jesus. We, we are. are. We, we are, are city, city gates. gates. We are city gates. Oh my gosh, you nailed Memory kicked in. <laughs> hey there, everyone. Vic here. Before we get into the rest of our service, I just want to remind you quickly about our old school, new school initiative. New school refers to the way that you are hearing and watching me right now. Uh, on screen, we're leveraging technology to communicate with you. Uh, but old school refers to uh, physical Bible. Uh, paper and leather, uh, a notebook and a pen that we are encouraging you to have with you, uh, to take notes as someone is preaching and to find those verses of scripture yourself and follow and read along. Uh, these things will not be up on the screen anymore as they used to be because we are trying to encourage participation and contribution uh, in a society that favors consumerism over those things. And so if you've forgotten your Bible or your notebook, this is a reminder to bring it next time. Uh, but if you have it with you, this is the moment to pull it out of your bag and to get ready as we kick off the rest of the service. God bless. Welcome City Gate. Welcome. Welcome City Gators, friends, mm -hmm. family, guests. So glad that you can join us here today. For those at a watch party, hello. Those mm -hmm. are at home, hello. On a laptop, on a TV screen. What a great day it is today and what an <sighs> awesome Sunday we have prepared for you. To all of our guests, Hi, welcome. Nice, so that, nice of you to join us. On the screen that there is a number that you can text us, mm -hmm. let us know how you're doing, where you're coming from, things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who are you? I am Vera. And I'm Corey. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want to skip that important no, detail. No, not at all. Oh, hi. <laughs> so just as an FYI, um, mm -hmm. we've moved to indoor watch parties yeah. now. So you don't have to brave the uh, the cold frozen north no longer uh, <laughs> as it gets colder and colder. So mm -hmm. um, that's great. There's actually going to be more of them moving mm -hmm. forward since they're moving indoors. That uh, kind of uh, puts a limit on um, certain numbers, mm -hmm. uh, which is great, though. We'll still be able to get together. Uh, we're still going to cater to the kids who will be at some of those uh, watch parties. So mix it up. Check them all out. Um, and don't forget to sign up because yeah, definitely sign up yeah. sign up You could do that on the uh, app and I think you can do it on the website mm -hmm. information will be on screen on how you can do that uh, And then also just another note uh, corporate prayer is mm -hmm. happening November 8th at 7 p.m. At the waypoint yeah. so be there. It's good to be together mm -hmm. and it's good to pray together mm -hmm. on that note however October 25th to the 29th I will say unfortunately the waypoint will be closed for the advanced conference mm -hmm. so if those of you who do come to the waypoint sorry just for those few days um, the waypoint will not be in service mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another thing that we do want to mention for those of you who have not signed up or are part of a community group I will I will Super, super, super encourage you to do that because it is the heartbeat of church. It's where you guys get, or anyone gets together. We go yeah. together. We're married. So we go to the same one. Yeah. It's we a good do. time. It is. It is a good time. It honestly is a good time. It is. It really allows us to um, be vulnerable with a group mm -hmm. of people who um, understand us, who will pray for us, who will walk with us mm -hmm. in times of sadness and in joy. And so I really encourage you guys, if you haven't gotten to know much people at um, City Gates, this is a great way to get to know yeah, people. Really good way. Um, and if you do know people and have um, thrived in community groups, continue to keep on coming. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, giving. Uh, for those who have been giving, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's a great thing that we get to do uh, in response to Christ's uh, overwhelming generosity to us. So uh, a few different ways that you can give. Um, you can give, first of all, via the Church Center mm -hmm. app or the website. And there are different things that you can give. You can give generally, uh, or you can be specific, give to the food bank yep. uh, or Victim Services Durham Region uh, or church planning as well, which goes towards right now uh, out in Connell, BC, mm -hmm. uh, Lawrence and Liz, there are church planning. So uh, those funds will be sent to them. Mm -hmm. 
for all any information that we've already said today or other things like events that are coming up in the near future please follow us on our socials at citygates ca Mm-hmm. At City That's Gates, the right one. Not dot .ca. Yeah, at, at CityGates C- yeah. CA. <laughs> you got it. Um, just to get a, a day-to-day, up-to-date, not day-to-day, but up-to-date. Staying in the loop. Just, just stay Casually in loop. staying in the loop. <laughs> just follow our socials. Please. Thank you. I think now, though, it's a perfect time to lead into some singing. Yeah, absolutely. It's so, been a pleasure. It's been an honor. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Take care. Have a good Sunday. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 12, 4-6, and let's read together as we prepare our hearts for worship. In that wonderful day, you will sing. Thank the Lord. Praise His name. Tell the nations what He has done. Let them know how mighty He is. Sing to the Lord, for he has done wonderful things. Make known his praise around the world. Let all the people of Jerusalem shout his praise with joy. For great is the Holy One of Israel who lives among you.
Hey, I'm Brian, and I'm going to lead us through a time of confession. Last Sunday, I spoke about um, how often we try to sit on the throne of our own life, how often we try to be God or be like God in our own lives, um, and just how so often we can actually think that we know better than God. Um, recently, in our small group, we were talking about um, controversial subjects and, um, you know, different ideologies and how Christians often fight about those things, both online and offline, and how often both sides of the party seem to think that they are for sure right and that God is definitely on their side. Um, and it just comes down to this about, again, us th thinking that we know best, um, not necessarily that we know better than God, but actually that we're just like God. Um, and we, this is not a new problem. You know, you think of Peter in the garden um, and how he chopped the ear of the guard off thinking that he was actually, you know, doing what God wanted him to do when in fact he was going directly against God's plan. Or even Joshua when he was speaking to the angel before going around Jericho and he said, are you for us or for our enemies? And the angel said, neither. Um, this is often where we find ourselves, is again, just thinking that God is on our side, that everything that we want is the same thing that God wants, when that, often, of course, is not the case. Um, and again, I, I'll read the same verse that I read last Sunday, Isaiah 55, 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. And so, I'm just going to read, um, we're going to read a prayer together, um, just in submission, a prayer that just admits that we often get so proud and full of ourselves and overly self-confident that we think that God is on our side and actually what we need to be doing is submitting to his will. So why don't we read this prayer out together? Loving Heavenly Father, forgive my pride in trying to second guess what you are doing and even trying to tell you at times what is best for my life. When you have a perfect plan and purpose, for all your children. Keep me broken at the cross, and may your will be done in my life. Amen. Let's take a moment to reflect on that. Well, luckily his mercies are new every morning, and even though we fall into this so easily, um, his grace just redeems our relationship with him. Um, and because of what Jesus has done, we can bring our brokenness to him honestly and know that he is a loving and merciful God. I'm just gonna read from Hebrews chapter four, verses 15 and 16, where it says, "'We do not have a high priest "'who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So just be encouraged by that as we go into our final song.
Well, good morning, City Gates. Uh, it's Mike here, and I'm really excited to be uh, sharing the Word of God with you today. We're going to be continuing in our series uh, from the books of Peter, First and Second Peter. We're going to be starting today, Second Peter. And uh, the other thing we're going to do today, which is which is a fun thing, is we're kind of starting this old school, new school initiative where we're encouraging you to, um, you know, hunt this yourself. Uh, for me, I'm a big fan of a paper, hard copy Bible rather than an electronic Bible. You can take notes in it. It just feels different. I've always enjoyed that process. So uh, it's, it's good to come back and just say, hey, let's, let's start getting our Bibles and bringing our Bibles to gatherings. And, and then let's take this notepad and a pen. And you may be rusty in knowing how to use this, but practice probably will pick it up pretty quickly. Uh, great discipline again. So we're going to avoid just scrolling the, the uh, scriptures down the screen. We'll give you the reference and ask you to join us in reading the Bible. So um, as we go into Second Peter today, um, we're going to look at this second letter where Peter again is writing probably to the same audience as First Peter, persecuted Christians living in five regions of Asia Minor. And I want to introduce this letter a little bit differently because um, I want to jump right down to verse uh, 12 and 13 of chapter 1 as a starting point, which is a little unusual, but if you don't mind turning in your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 12 and 13, this will be the launch for what I'm sharing today. I am actually going to read this from the New Living Translation. Therefore, I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth that you have been taught. And it's only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live. You know, um, we all love the new, we all love the exciting, we all love the big event, you know, the accomplishment. But most of the time our lives uh, have those items, kind of those instant moments scattered through them rather than being the norm. Most of our lives are quite mundane and repetitive. We go to work or school, we, we do our chores, we clean, we, you know, we, all the, the basic life things. Um, and they're usually pretty similar, all pretty regular. You know, and occasionally we do have the high points of a graduation or a new career or a baby or a grandchild, whatever it is. Uh, and as parents, we not only get to, to enjoy the occasional high points in our own lives, we also get to uh, do the same with those uh, in our, of our children. But you know, when we're parenting, our children do not go from zero to graduation. Uh, they learn uh, life basics over and over again as part of their growth. Uh, they're taught to shower every day and brush their teeth and wear clean clothes. And then you have to remind them to do it over and over again. Um, they know how, they have to do their homework and study for exams. And we have to hold them accountable to do that and check up on them, make sure they realize how important that is. And if they're doing a musical instrument, as an example, they have to keep playing the same chords over and over, even though they know them repetitively until they perfect it. You know, and they have to learn to be on time for that first part-time job and follow the instructions of their boss over and over again. And one day they graduate, not as an event, but as a culmination of a trained life. You should tweet that. Uh, you know, the Apostle Peter, early on in his second letter, reminds the readers uh, that he's about to share with them things that they already know. But the reality is, is he's doing that because Christianity is all about learning. It's all about remembering. And then it's all about being reminded about what Jesus has done for us, who Jesus is, and what Jesus has done for us. You know, in the first letter, Peter reminded uh, these, uh, these believers that they were elect exiles, called to live differently among hostility and persecution. You know, he reminded them that they were living stones, that they were God's spiritual temple, that they were a chosen race, a holy nation living in the midst of unholy people. And as such, he reminded them how to live as Christ followers uh, under unjust governments, how to live as employees with unfair bosses, how to grow godly families when everybody else was living differently and going in the opposite direction. 
And he reminded them that they were going to suffer as a result of doing that, as he reminded them that their Lord and Savior and model, Jesus Christ, had done on their behalf so that they may have a living and an eternal hope. And as we start to, to uh, study Second Peter, we'll realize that Peter is continually reminding the believers about who they are and the power of the scriptures to guard themselves against the dangers of false teaching and teachers. So we're going to jump right in now back to verse 1. And again, if you don't mind turning, that would be terrific. Verse 1, chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, in 1 Peter, Peter introduced himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. But in his second letter, he added the description servant to his greeting. So he first one was apostle, which means messenger, among other things. But the second one, he said, I'm a messenger and I'm also a servant. And when you look at that word, it means a bond servant or a bond slave. Uh, at that point, he's saying, I'm not just speaking for Jesus, but my life is so intricately connected with him and his people that I'm using this term bond servant to, to make sure you understand that. Now, for many of us, we may know what a bond servant is, but if you don't, a bond servant or a bond slave was someone who had been owned by somebody else in slavery, was released either by the end of his term or just because the, 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 the person wanted to give him freedom or, or her freedom. But then they chose to come back of their own volition and serve that same master for the rest of their life. And um, it's, a, it's a massively significant event when somebody became a bond slave. It was a commitment level that was um, unprecedented. And Peter was saying in this greeting that he was all in. He was all in. He had pushed all of his chips in the middle of the table. And he's saying, I'm all in with you guys in this journey together. And he was all in with a faith, a Christian faith that is the ultimate leveler. You know, this faith that we're a part of doesn't differentiate between rich and poor um, or social class or between, ra you know, it doesn't uh, work within racial divides or even historical timelines. You know, the faith that Peter is describing is a faith that both Gentiles and Jews shared at the time of writing, but also it's the same faith that we share today hasn't got better or worse. We don't have a new and improved version of that faith. We have the same faith, which is absolutely incredible. <clears throat> it's a faith that was theirs, and it's a faith that is ours because it was secured on our behalf by a Savior who is the same yesterday, same today, and the same forever. You know, the common denominator of people that obtain the, this faith of equal standing, as he talks about, is that they recognize their need for such a savior. Somebody wrote this, a savior is one who brings salvation. And the word salvation was familiar to the people of that day. <clears throat> In their vocabulary, it meant deliverance from trouble, particularly deliverance from the enemy. It also carried the idea of health and safety. A physician who looked on, uh, sorry, a physician was looked on as a savior because he helped deliver the body from pain and limitations. A victorious general was a savior because he delivered the people from defeat. Even a wise official was a savior because he kept the region or the nation in order and delivered it from confusion and decay. It requires little insight, the author says, to see how the title savior applies to our Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, he is the great physician who heals the heart from the sickness of sin. He is the victorious conqueror who has defeated our enemies, sin, death, Satan, and hell, and is leading us in triumph. Wonderful. So we understand that, uh, you know, he's referencing the fact that Jesus is our Savior. And we go right on to verse 2, and it says this in verse 2, 
May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You know, there's three foundational spiritual commodities that somebody, somebody wrote that, um, that are secured the second that we come to faith in this Savior. They are righteousness, they are grace, and they are peace. And he's referenced all those three in the first two verses. You know, as I was thinking about this, it really is scandalous that people like you and I, who recognize our helplessness, um, are just given these things for free when we meet this Savior, when we give our lives to the Savior. You know, I remember as a kid, and I don't know why I used to think like this, even though I was not a, I didn't believe in God at all, I was faith neutral at best, um, when I did bad stuff, I kind of had this thing where I expected the universe to smack me back. Don't ask me why I thought that, but I, I would almost kind of do something and think, man, it's gonna be some, there's going to be some consequence to this for sure. Um, but the reality is when we talk about righteousness, when I came into right standing with God, I stopped looking over my shoulder. Very hard to, to uh, describe why that was, other than the fact that I was made right with the Master. And I stopped looking over my shoulder. You know, when it comes to grace, you know, we all grow up earning everything and being proud of it. You know, uh, and so even as when we're approaching the Savior, we inherently want to do something. You know, grace is just such a hard thing to accept. You mean you love me unconditionally even though I've done dot, 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 question mark? You know, can I at least do something to make this mercy seem a little less like mercy? And uh, yeah, I mean, grace is just a difficult thing to fathom. It's by grace we've been saved through faith. And the reason is because otherwise we would boast, the scripture says. So he comes, he hunts us down, saves us unconditionally, and then does not hold our past offenses against us. And, uh, you know, talking about peace, how can somebody who spent a lifetime searching for peace and being constantly disappointed suddenly experience both peace with God and the peace of God? How can that happen? You know, on my recent trip to the UK, I sat down with somebody close to me and I just simply told them that they had no peace. And the only way they would ever get it was by meeting the Prince of Peace. You know, almost 40 years into my Christian life, I constantly remind myself that these three spiritual realities uh, of meeting the Savior have been multiplied many times over in my life. And daily, they're multiplied. Grace is renewed daily. Mercy is something I need daily. Righteousness is, is something I have to remind myself about daily. And uh, as we do that, we certainly grow. Let's go to verse 3. And again, I'm reading from the New Living in this case. Uh, By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know Him the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. You know, over these uh, aforementioned close to four decades of my Christian life, I, we, talking about myself and my wife, we've seen a lot of people come by with new and fresh God revelations um, that most often have some kind of a mysterious element and more than often are birthed in someone's unique experience. You know, it, it might be someone that has supposedly gone to heaven and has now been tasked with writing a book describing their experience, which is really super helpful because Jesus forgot to add those details in the scriptures. So it's really helpful to have those details. Um, 
It could be uh, someone that's had an amazing experience with angels, uh, where there are very deep one-on-one -on -one conversations and incredible revelations that they received, uh, usually in their bedrooms. Um, or it may be someone that's taken a really deep dive into, uh, into you know, Jewish uh, traditions and customs and has found the key to a more intimate relationship with the Messiah. And there may also be, from somebody else, the promise of power that will be unlocked if you purchase this vial of water that has come directly from the River Jordan or a small amount of oil that has been pressed from an anointed Middle Eastern olive. You know, this is not new stuff. You know, Peter is writing the second letter to warn the believers about the lure of false prophets and false teachers and is reminding them of who they are and what they have. And here's the, here's the kicker from verse 3. God has powerfully given every believer everything needed to live a godly life. You know, um, I, read, I, I just want to reiterate this and then quote somebody. When we are born into the family of God by faith in Christ Jesus, we are born complete. God gives us everything we will ever need for life and godliness with nothing to be added. You know, the false teachers, I'm quoting, claimed that they had a special doctrine that nothing could be added to. Uh, sorry, that would add something to the lives of Peter's readers. I apologize. But Peter knew that nothing could be added to them. Just as a normal baby is born with all the equipment he needs for life and only needs to grow, so the Christian has all that is needed and only needs to grow. Just as a baby has a definite genetic structure that determines how he or she will grow, so the believer is genetically structured to experience glory and virtue. One day we will be like Jesus Christ. We have been called to his eternal glory and we shall share that glory when Jesus Christ returns and takes his people to heaven. We're also called to virtue. We have been saved so that we might show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. First Peter 2 uh, verse, sorry, 1 Peter 2 verse 9. We should not wait until we get to heaven to become like Jesus. We should, um, in our character and conduct, we should reveal his beauty and grace today. And, and so I want us just to, to I'm just going to really end off here at verse 4. So let's read that together. And, uh, and let me comment on verse 4. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the corruption, uh, sorry, escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. I'm going to read that one more time. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. You know, new lives need a new diet. Babies in the womb are fed through the umbilical cord and on arrival outside immediately latch themselves onto the mum for nourishment. Hopelessly lost people that are rescued by the Savior pretty quickly start to realize that the things that used to feed them are now incompatible with their new life. Peter used this exact uh, terminology or analogy actually in the first letter. Flip back to 1 Peter chapter 1, just turn left a couple of pages and we'll see in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it says this, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. You know, enter the scriptures. You know, this magnificent living book is filled to the brim with ironclad promises that apply to our 
present lives and the world to come. And when we read them and we allow them to, those words to enter into our hearts and enter into our minds, the new life inside of us is nourished and little by little we start to share in our Savior's divine nature. You know, and the hold that our previous lives had on us and the corrupting elements of our previous diet start to slip away. The word that's used here is the word escape, which is both dramatic and powerful. That which once held us, that which once snared us, that which once seduced us, that which once trapped us, um, is now broken as these great and precious promises from the Word of God come alive in us. And they enlarge the reality of Jesus within us. And when we escape, we don't look back. We have a new life. We develop new appetites. We bear new fruit. We find ourselves with a new purpose. And we end up with a new mission. You know, it doesn't mean that all this change is instant. Um, we grow up into salvation. But I will say with certainty that when the Word of God becomes central in our lives, we will continue to see an upward trajectory as Jesus will be more, uh, more visible through us tomorrow than he is today. You know, I just want to uh, end off by, by sharing a story. Um, you know, when we first became Christians, it's a long time ago, and I really hate using stories from a long, long time ago. I think we should try to use current stories, but I think this is particularly profound based on the passage that, uh, that I'm using. When we became Christians, we um, uh, became Christians in Canada, and then we went back with a business to the UK, and we spent a year in the UK developing this business. But at the same time, the business development was basically irrelevant in comparison with the fact that this was our grounding time for our new life in Christ. We joined a church and this was all new to us. We had no frame of reference for what church life was like, but we were hungry. We had realized the helplessness of our previous life. We realized so many of our previous appetites were unhelpful and damaging and it hadn't helped us in our lives, our marriage. And we wanted, a new, we, we were just starting to get this new appetite. Somebody gave us a Bible, or just you know, me a Bible, I'd read a Bible, I couldn't put it down. We just started reading that Bible through and through. Um, there was, uh, it was a house church, so they met once a month in, um, in a larger gathering, but they met in smaller gatherings through the week, something like we're doing. Um, and we were so hungry that we joined three different house groups. We asked permission if we could join three separate house groups. So we were going into these groups every night to hear the word of God and to learn and to feed and to just change our lives. And just this miracle of change started to happen. I found myself hanging out with people that I would never have hung out with before. I felt like I, before I would have felt like I was way up here and they were way down here and I would never have hung out with them. Started hanging out with people like that. Um, little bit by little bit, attitudes changed. Uh, uh, my language changed. I went from dropping the F-bomb every other sentence to one day look back and went, man, I don't even notice, I don't even cuss anymore. I didn't even try to stop. There was just these these subtle changes that happened, but our intake had changed and our fruit was now slowly starting to change. And when I came back to Canada a year in, we came back to Canada to, to re-kick off our life over here. And I remember walking into the office of somebody that I had worked with closely for a number of years. And I walked in, I hadn't seen them for probably a year and a half, that's all. And the person was, was, was looking down at their paper. They were doing some paperwork. And they looked up and they made eye contact with me. And they said, I recognize you. How do I know you? And I went, Bob. That was his name, Bob. Bob, it's Mike. We worked together for four years. And all he said was this. He said, what happened to you? And he never even heard me speak. Some, somehow, even the change on the inside had affected the outside to the point where he didn't even recognize me. And of course that led to a, you know, as soon as I sat down and shared a bit with him, he leant over, grabbed a pen, 
and made an appointment with me. He said, I want to hear more. And we went and we had breakfast maybe a week later. So, um, you know, we have these great and precious promises so that we can become div uh, partakers of that divine nature. And so when we get into this, and we do it systematically and make it central in our lives. And again, I'm reminding you, most of you, of things that you know today. You know about this. I'm just reminding you, as Peter reminded those followers and believers, because if we don't do that, it's easy for us to make other things the main thing, to go off on tangents, to be easily deceived, to fall under the prey of the current narrative around vaccines, conspiracies, anti-vaccines, whatever your deal is. Easy for us to make those things the main thing when we cease to make the Word of God central. I'm going to stop at verse 4. Toby, I believe, is going to take, uh, pick up from us uh, next week. Um, but I do want to pray with you uh, before we conclude. So, Father, I ask that this, these simple reminders, the reminders of the reality of our righteousness, the, remi the reality of our, the grace of God we experience every day in our lives, and our need for constant mercy. Lord, as, we, as we're reminded of those things and the fact that we have given, been given these great and precious promises so that we may, may become partakers of your divine nature, I want us, and starting with me, to, to remind ourselves again of the power of the Scriptures and the power of change in our lives. So, Lord, would you change us? Would you continue to use the, the Bible, the Word of God, community, and other things around us to make us more like Jesus so that we may present and represent you well? And I ask this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for that word, Mike. It's, it's so important to recognize these things from this passage. City Gators, I just want to leave you with this. We are called to growth, um, to slow, steady, sure growth. It's what Peter says um, in, uh, at the end of his letter in uh, chapter 3 when he says, uh, uh, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus and Savior Jesus Christ. But the call is to grow. And that's not a sprint. <laughs> Peter's not saying, hey, be able to uh, you know, memorize your Bible backwards and forwards. Be able to pray for three hours straight um, tomorrow. Uh, he's saying train. He's saying put in a little bit of a t at a time. Um, every day, just like you would as you're building any other skill. You, Mozart didn't learn to play the kinds of symphonies um, that, he, that he, he conducted. He didn't, he didn't learn to develop those all in one night. It was one piece of effort and time and half an hour chunks and five minute chunks and several hour chunks at a time. And growth for us works the same way. It's spending time with Jesus, engaging in the kinds of spiritual habits that we need to. And, and then the Holy Spirit comes underneath and he empowers that whole thing. And so I want to encourage you with that. God is for you. He's, he's with you in this process. And he's with you in this coming week. And as we go, I just want to read uh, this benediction over you uh, to bless you as you continue to pursue Jesus, as you engage in, in the things that will bring you closer to him and avoid the things that will keep you far from him. And it comes from 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, it's the end of, end of 1 Thessalonians. And this is, this is God's word to you, City Gates. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. May grace and peace be multiplied to you this week. City Gators, God bless.